Let's talk about the brain, the regions of the brain, and how an injury of any of these regions might impact a person's functional and cognitive abilities. So to start, we have to look at the brain in various different lobes. You're well aware of these lobes, but as a reminder, in red we have frontal, in yellow we have parietal, in blue we have temporal, in green we have occipital, purple we have cerebellum, and gray brainstem down below. Now, any injury across the board, a traumatic brain injury, a stroke, whether it be ischemic or hemorrhagic, or any neurological dysfunction that might have a lesion or a deficit in any specific region of the brain, will ultimately have similar impairments. So when looking at the neurological population, what we first have to do is understand the neuroanatomy and the pathophysiology of their injury. If somebody were to have a frontal lobe injury, for example, we might expect them to have significant loss or inability to sequence. Now, whenever we discuss any of these activities, especially with the frontal lobe, we're not only talking about motor, we're also talking about cognitive as well. Inability to sequence, as an example, uh, combined with loss of spontaneity and in interacting with others and loss of flexibility of thinking, could dramatically impact how a person functions throughout the day how they move, how they interact with objects, how they interact with others, and how they perform their activities of daily living. For example, if a person is accustomed to drinking water out of a cup that has no handles, uh, and they have a frontal lobe injury, and you now give them a cup that has a handle, like a coffee mug, they might have lack of inability, lack of ability uh, to have flexible thinking, and as a result, the inability to sequence that task. So just looking at that cup, they might now be unable to pick up the cup because there's the addition of the handle. Another major uh, uh, injury uh, that occurs in the frontal lobe is a person will now present with perseveration. They will not be able to talk about a different topic. They will always have to talk or discuss the same topic over and over again in repetition. Now that said, that same person might have a topic, one topic they always come back to because they're perseverating on it, but they might also be highly distractible and unable to complete that thought. They may have confabulation, where they have imagining activities or hallucinations that actually do happen in their mind, but aren't happening in reality. They may be emotionally labile, have change in their personality or social behavior. Disinhibition uh, is very common. Difficulty with problem solving. And one of the most important areas that's effect that can be affected is Broca's area, also causing Broca's aphasia, or ex expressive speech deficits. So the frontal lobe really puts everything together when it comes to thought, function, purpose, uh, interacting with your environment or others. Everything really has to pass through the frontal lobe. Now you can refer back to the FNA uh, lecture, which kind of takes you through the sequence of a thought to action uh, movement. Um, which kind of describes a little bit more about how the frontal lobe will impact our movements. So next let's move on to parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is uh, essentially where we're going to uh, start to interpret things. We can pull in vision, we can pull in audible, we can pull in sensation, but in the parietal lobe we have to start to interpret what does that all mean. So um, if you were to have a deficit in the parietal lobe, this is where you would come up with all of the, the four A's, we call them, the anomia, the agraphia, the alexia, the apraxia. And uh, you can refer to your lecture for more detail on all of these. Uh, but in addition, difficulty drawing objects, difficulty distinguishing left from right, difficulty calculating. The easiest way to look at this really is processing. Information is coming in. You now have to process the difference you have to exchange information across the corpus callosum, left and right, and this is done in the parietal lobe in many cases. And as a result, a person will have difficulty with all of these interpretive type of activities. And most specifically, they will actually have an inability to attend to more than one object at a time. This is a common symptom that you'll see. Okay, next we have the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe overall is additionally where we process information. Now this is more importantly where we're going to process and interact with the outside or external 
environment. So difficulty recognizing faces, uh, difficulty uh, understanding audible communication that's coming in with Wernicke's aphasia. You'll have disturbance in selective attention to what we see in here. There's difficulty with identification of and verbalization about objects. So now we're looking at something, trying to internalize what that is, and now trying to describe it back. You will have short-term memory loss, and you actually have interference with the process between short-term to long-term memory loss. Now, in order to really discuss memory loss, we, we would need an entire semester to talk about the processing centers of bringing in short-term memory, transferring it over to long-term memory. But we can be safe to say that if, if somebody were to have temporal lobe damage, they might very well have difficulty with both short-term and long-term memory. You may also see increased aggressive behavior, uh, which will naturally play into the rehab role significantly, and inability to categorize objects. So overall, again, the temporal lobe is where you're going to pull that information in from your sensory input, have to process it, and now have to return that information out. If we were to come back and look at the comparison between temporal and parietal, the easiest way to differentiate would be that parietal has difficulty processing the information as it comes in, and also has separate diff difficulty uh, processing information to get it out. However, the temporal lobe has specific differentiation uh, difficulty, my apologies, difficulty with bringing information in, processing that information, and then putting that information out. So temporal lobe is really the processing center. Occipital lobe, on the other hand, is actually much more of uh, an uh, input center. So if you have damage here, you're going to lose some visual fields. You're going to have difficulty locate, locating objects in the environment. You'll have difficulty identifying colors. You may have hallucinations as a result of the difficulty to um, have adequate optical illusion or optical vision, I should say. You'll have visual illusions, word blindness, difficulty in recognizing drawn objects. All of this really comes back to difficulty in processing your vision. Uh, some, some might have, some of you may have heard of something called central blindness, and central blindness is essentially where a person has occipital lobe damage, and all of the receptors are working. They, their eyes can actually see. Their optic chiasm is fully intact and working. But when that information all comes in, by the time it gets to its processing center, which is the occipital lobe, uh, there's no ability to process it. So uh, all of that is due to a lesion in the occipital lobe. Okay, so the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum has its own talk, its own lecture, its own details. In the focal neurological approach lecture, uh, we differentiate out the different types or different portions of the cerebellum and how they interact with one another as well as the other regions of the brain to allow or perform movement. So cerebellum is quite complex. I think it's imperative that you do watch that portion of the video and have a strong understanding of it. And we'll delve a little bit deeper into the generalities of the cerebellum. So overall, the cerebellum helps us control our coordinated fine movements. Uh, it helps us control also not so fine movements like uh, the ability to walk. So ultimately, the best way to look at the cerebellum is if you have damage in your cerebellum, you're going to have difficulty with coordination. If you have difficulty with coordination, you're going to have difficulty with balance. Dizziness is really a result of the lack of coordination and the lack of processing of information, uh, your afferents crossing over into your efferents. Tremors, slurred speech, and ataxia are all a result of lack of a coordinated movement. So we move down to the regional area of the brainstem. The brainstem is essentially is a relay center or a processing center. There are a couple key areas, though, within the brainstem that will actually control some automatic or autonomic activities, such as breathing, heart rate, our, our circadian rhythm. So as a result, if you have brainstem damage, you can have decreased vital capacity in breathing, dysphagia, difficulty with organizing or perception of the environment, as well as sleeping difficulties. Now, I, I understand that I didn't mention anything about difficulty with organization or perception and dysphagia and how that might relate to the brainstem. Uh, however, this all comes back to how it's a relay center. The information, the afferent coming in, coordinating with the efferent going out. Ultimately, if you have a disrupt there, you're naturally going to have difficulty with speech and you'll have difficulty with uh, organization and perception of the environment. So, 
that's a quick overview of the regional areas of the brain. And ultimately, when you look back at any brain injury or anything that will have an impact on the brain, you're going to come back and, and look at this region here. You're going to define which region of the brain it is, which lobe it is, and then you're going to delve deeper to understand what the injuries are, and then ultimately now you're going to understand what you should expect with that patient. So that's one part. Now the next part is how could we possibly damage this area? Well, if we have a brain injury, that's going to be an obvious significant damage, a bruise, a cut, a destructive activity to a region of the brain. However, in a case of cerebral vascular accidents or a stroke, it really comes back to the vascular network that supplies the brain with blood. So that vascular network is at its base uh, discussed with the circle of Willis. So when we look at the underside of the brain, and this is a cross-sectional view of the, the brain looking from underneath up, you can see in the bottom you have your brain stem right across the to the top of your picture where you're going to have your frontal lobe. So let's take a closer look at the uh, overall circulation and its impacts on the brain. So the circle of Willis. This is our defining area of circulation to the brain. Take a slightly deeper look. We have our anterior cerebral artery, which is a major, pl major player here, and our middle cerebral artery, which are major players here. So if you have blood flow, or lack of blood flow, I should say, to any area of the circle of Willis, the good news is there are regions that will compensate for it, or overcome that, and that's why it's a circle. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen, and it's not uh, a foolproof circulatory system. So if you did have damage to one of these arteries, you may ultimately end up having loss of function in a regional area of the brain. So rather than getting into exactly what will happen if you have a deficit in the anterior cerebral artery, let's first take a quick look at what will happen, uh, what region of the brain will lose blood flow. Then we can go back to understanding our regions of the brain, and now we ultimately will know if I have a blockage of blood in one area, how's that going to impact me overall. So the anterior cerebral artery. Anterior cerebral artery has, uh, feeds into the frontal and parietal lobes on the medial section. This is going to be critical for our future discussions. It's not the lateral, it's the medial coming from the anterior cerebral artery. Your corpus callosum as well as your cingulate gyrus. Come on back out, let's take a look at the next big one, the middle cerebral artery. So that is going to feed our lateral portion of our frontal lobe and parietal lobe. So again, anterior cerebral artery feeds the medial side of the frontal lobe and parietal lobe and our middle cerebral artery feeds our lateral side of the frontal and parietal lobe. Middle cerebral artery is also going to feed into your temporal lobe and resultant basal ganglia. Let's work our way down a bit and take a look at our posterior cerebral artery. Posterior cerebral artery anatomically is located right near the occipital lobe Naturally, it's going to impact the occipital cortex, which is the center portion. Your temporal cortex, right next to that temporal cortex, is where your thalamus and your subthalamic nuclei are. So they're going to be impacted or uh, get their blood, fro blood flow from the posterior cerebral artery. Okay, so to move a little bit further back now, we have our cerebellar arteries. So our superior cerebellar artery does exactly what it says. It feeds our superior cerebellum. And as a result, it will also feed the neighboring cerebellar pedicles. If we go down a little bit further into our inferior cerebral, cerebellar artery, this is now going to affect the inferior border of the cerebellum, which is going to be in alignment with the brainstem. So you're going to have impact on the cranial nerves, the cerebellar pedicles, and the inferior cerebellum. So taking a little bit of an anatomical approach, we can look at these things, we can break the brain down, and look at what regions are going to be impacted if we have lack of blood flow. And it, once we have that lack of blood flow, we now have to draw back on our memory of what those regions of the brain are. And ultimately, that's going to tell us if we have a blockage in the anterior uh, cerebral artery, what lobe is going to be impacted and what functional deficits would we expect from our patient.